Hello, everyone. Uh, it gives me a great uh, pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you all uh, today to today's uh, International League Against Epilepsy uh, webinar on uh, developmental epileptic uh, encephalopathies and update uh, uh, on a uh, very important uh, topic that uh, poses a great uh, challenge uh, to us uh, pediatric uh, neurologists who are working with uh, children uh, with epilepsies, where it poses uh, a diagnostic and therapeutic uh, challenge uh, to many of uh, us. Uh, therefore, uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this exciting uh, talk, um, and uh, uh, thank you for your attendance and interest, interest to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, it gives me a great honor and a uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Edward uh, Kija, uh, who is uh, who did uh, his uh, undergraduate um, uh, uh, training in uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, at uh, uh, Mohibili uh, University, and then uh, pursued a postgraduate uh, degree in pediatric neurology uh, specialty and master of philosophy at the University of uh, Cape Town. He is currently a senior uh, lecturer at uh, 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 in Tanzania, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kija had won uh, many prizes and awards uh, during his uh, 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 training, and including the Bernard de Souza Award of Child Neurology Society in the States, and have uh, multiple publications in the field of uh, pediatric neurology. Uh, I would like to rem remind uh, the attendees to uh, put their questions in uh, the question and answer uh, box uh, in order to go uh, through them uh, later after uh, uh, we uh, finish uh, with the talk. Uh, Dr. Kija, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Amna Al-Fataizi, uh, Al for a very um, nice words of introduction. I'll now share my screen. Okay, as, um, and, and thank you everybody for joining wherever you are. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's good evening from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And um, I work, uh, as Dr. al has said, I work at the Moimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences. I'm one of the faculties in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. And this is the hospital where I practice. Um, our university is affiliated with two hospitals, and this is one of them, and the other one is on the on the right side. Um, so today we're going to be talking about developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, um, which is one of um, an important uh, component uh, in the classification um, of epilepsy, as you all um, uh, know. Um, classification of epilepsy has been evolving since uh, the inception of the International League Against Epilepsy in the 1900s. And uh, this concept has been um, ever evolving with um, different commissions on classification and terminologies uh, where different terminologies have been introduced and some of them have been removed based on the understanding of the um, different epilepsy conditions based on the semiology, electrophysiological studies, uh, neuroimaging, metabolic testing, and of recently uh, advancements in molecular, in, in, in molecular uh, genetic studies. And one of the concepts which has been, uh, which has gained much attention of recent since the early 2000s is the concept of uh, developmental, uh, is the concept of epileptic encephalopathy and developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, which is a, a topic of our discussion for today. Um, so this will be my outline of my talk. So I will begin uh, looking at the history of the evolution of the term, and, and then I'll give a brief overview of the uh, neonatal onset, as well as infantile onset developmental encephalopathies. And also I'll give an overview of the common childhood onset developmental encephalopathies. Uh, because of the limitation of time, I will not cover all the DEEs, uh, but I'll just cover the, uh, the, the common ones that 
Uh, we as practicing clinicians and practicing pediatric neurologists, we commonly face uh, during our daily practice. So the, 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 the first reported cases of the association between seizures and cognitive decline was reported um, since the uh, 1800s, um, where by a letter by a British sergeant, Dr. William West, who had written a letter to the editor of The Lancet, uh, reporting what he had noted as symptoms and cognitive decline in his own child. And in his letter, um, he wrote that he had, by that time he was writing his letter, this, uh, his child was one year old and he had noted symptoms since the age of four months, where he noted uh, the head was uh, bobbing forwards, uh, as well as the knees, jump, uh, the knees uh, flexing up. And this was later uh, described as infantile spasms um, in, in, with, with uh, further researchers, but with the onset of these symptoms, this, um, the son of Dr. William West had cognitive, um, had motor and cognitive uh, regression. Subsequently, um, it was not until the 1950s when the concept of epileptic encephalopathy was um, initially used, and it was used by Dr. Henry Gasto when he was describing children who had tonic seizures with motor and behavioral regression. And he also used the same term describing what we uh, now call the uh, West syndrome, which is the manifestation of um, epileptic spasms and uh, developmental regression. In the 1960s, again, the same term epileptic encephalopathy was used, uh, this time by uh, two um, a famous neurologists, uh, Dr. William Landau and uh, Dr. Frank Kef uh, Klefner who described language regression and epilepsy in, in a cohort of children. And they also coined uh, the word epileptic encephalopathies. And the hypothesis during this time was that the seizures and the inter-ictoepileptiform discharges could be contributing to cognitive and behavioral regression, which was noted in these children who had West syndrome, uh, the later uh, lennox gastaut syndrome, as well as the Landau and Kleffner syndrome. Following uh, the initial description in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was several debates and discussion with regard to the term epileptic encephalopathies in the International League Against Epilepsy. But it was not until 2001 when the International League Against Epilepsy in its Commission for Classification and Terminology coined or officially defined epileptic encephalopathy. And this was defined as a condition in which the epileptiform activity contributed to the disturbance in cerebral function. And in this paper, they uh, highlighted three key important features which contributed to epileptic encephalopathies, which are one, seizures, two, EEG abnormality, and, second, and third is the cognitive decline. Five years later, the term epileptic encephalopathy as other classification um, uh, of epilepsy has been evolving. It was further clarified again by the International League that not only the epileptiform activity, which is responsible for the cognitive decline, but also the etiology of epileptic, um, um, the etiology of the epilepsy, as well as the treatment with anti seizure medication, was also um, 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 thought to be contributing to the cognitive dysfunction. And during this time, it was also um, um, deemed to be important to distinguish the contribution of the cognitive decline um, into uh, three aspects. One, the cause of epilepsy itself, which could be contributing to the cognitive decline, the pharmacotherapy, as well as the epilepsy itself. Now, this was a mammoth uh, task in trying to differentiate uh, the contribution of each of these uh, three parameters into the deficits of cognitive decline. So um, in most of the um, uh, epileptic encephalopathy, this distinction of which, um, uh, um, how much of these three factors contribute to the cognitive de decline remain mostly to be in theory. Um, it was not until the 2010, uh, when uh, again, the concept of epileptic encephalopathy was further clarified and in this time, uh, the, um, it, it was thought that the um, epileptic encephalopathy, it is the epileptic activity itself which contribute to severe cognitive and behavioral imp impairments, 
which is above and beyond what might be expected from the underlying pathology alone, and this could worsen over time. And uh, it was postulated that if seizures and interictal epileptum activity were controlled, then this would uh, lead to an improved outcome in patients who are suffering from epileptic encephalopathy. In, 20, uh, in 2017, which is the latest classification uh, of epilepsy by the International League, um, two further terms were introduced into the classifications, and these are um, developmental encephalopathy and developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, which is our topic for discussion today. Now, following further research and further understanding to, the, uh, to epilepsy, it was also described that the developmental, in, in, uh, the developmental impact that children with epileptic encephalopathy face, uh, in, in some of these patients, it is independent uh, of the epileptic encephalopathy itself. And in some of the children, the developmental delay precedes the seizure onset. And uh, it was also uh, found out that in some of these patients, the encephalopathy and epilepsy are independently um, uh, arise from either uh, independent symptoms of either a known or unknown condition, which could either be a genetic condition or it might be a structural genetic condition. And in some of these children, there was no enough evidence to support that epileptic activity is primarily responsible for the, develop, uh, for the developmental stag uh, stagnation in these patients. So based on that, uh, the International League proposes uh, proposed three terminologies to be used uh, in children. These ones are developmental encephalopathy, which uh, was defined as the developmental impairment without frequent epileptic, uh, epileptic activity, which is uh, associated with regression or further slowing of development. And to use the term developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, where both the developmental encephalopathy and epileptic encephalopathy occurs in a child. Now, to put this simply in a schematic uh, picture is um, an, an epilepsy could be uh, caused by, might have an etiology, which could either be a genetic, it could be structural, it could be metabolic, it could be immune mediated, or it could be infectious. And this etiology of epilepsy, could, uh, this etiology could independently lead to developmental impairment, or it could independently lead to seizures and frequent interictal discharges. So when these two happen in, one, uh, in, in a patient, then these are regarded as the developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. So what about the pathophysiology? Now, um, there's the pathophysiology of epileptic uh, encephalopathy and pathophysiology of developmental and epileptic encephalopathy has not been clearly defined. And most of the evidence that we do have comes from animal studies. And the hypothesis is the existence of epileptic discharges could either lead into three possible uh, pathways. Number one, the epileptic discharges could lead to inhibition of distant brain areas which are connected to the epileptic focus. And consequent to this inhibition, this may lead into cognitive impairment. The other possibility could be the epileptic discharges may lead to alteration or neuronal development and lead could lead into defect in synaptic connectivity and eventually this uh, may eventually lead into impaired cognition. Third possibility is epileptic discharges may lead into transient It may lead into transit effects on information processing, and eventually this may also lead into cognitive impairment. So what is the, what is the epidemiology, uh, epidemiology of uh, uh, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy? What do we know uh, regarding the magnitude of, of this condition? So uh, there hasn't been many studies which had looked into the prevalence of DEE itself, um, except uh, there's this uh, huge study which was done in Scotland, which looked at um, more than uh, about 390 children in different clinics, uh, uh, tertiary centers in Scotland. And what they found 
is uh, the most um, um, the most common form of developmental of DEE was infantile spasm syndrome, which was uh, followed by the early infantile developmental uh, encephalopathy. And the third was the Dravet syndrome. And all this uh, DEE had different etiologies, uh, whether it could be a structural or immune, or it could be a, a genetic causes or, or the um, uh, infectious causes. With the infantile spasm syndrome, the most common cause which was found was uh, the, 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 the structural malformations. So I will now give a brief overview of some of these uh, uh, developmental um, and epileptic encephalopathy. And I will begin with the early infantile developmental and um, early infantile DEE, which includes syndromes which were previously classified as the early infantile epileptic encephalopathy, also known as the Otahara syndrome and the early myoclonic encephalopathy uh, syndrome. So these syndromes, um, they have overlap in terms of their clinical presentations and they share some of the uh, similar um, etiologies, which include genetic uh, mutations, structural malformations, as well as metabolic uh, abnormalities. The incidence is estimated to be 10 uh, per 100,000. And most of them begin in children who are less than three months and both male and boys are affected equally. In most of these babies, the uh, uh, history, the pregnancy history and birth history are usually normal. And subsequently, most of these babies end up with impaired development, uh, varying in severity, which ranges from moderate to profound uh, developmental impairment. Um, the, they all present with multiple seizure types, uh, but the diagnosis requires a presentation of at least uh, one or more of the following seizures. They may present with tonic seizures, which may either be focal or generalized tonic seizures. They also present with myoclonic seizures. They may present with epileptic spasms, and some of them may present with sequential seizures, which may either be tonic, it may be clonic, or which may present with or without autonomic components, and some of these patients may present with automatism. The um, when it comes to um, uh, electrophysiological studies, the interictal EEG usually shows abnormal background with the classic uh, uh, presentation of the bus suppression pattern, which may occur either in the awake or in the asleep state. In most of these, uh, uh, the bus suppression tends to be unresponsive to stimulation. The bus usually has a, has a high amplitude of about 150 to 300 microvolts lasting for about one to five seconds, which usually fo followed by a suppression, lasting for about three to 10 seconds, usually a lower amplitude of less than five microvolts. Apart from the classic bus suppression pattern, the early infantile DEE may also present with multifocal spikes. They may also present with spike wave discharges. Sharp wave with or without slowing has also been reported, as well as discontinuous or diffuse slowing uh, during the interictal phase. The ictal EEG usually depends on the seizure type patient presenting with. With the tonic seizures, usually presents with low voltage and high frequency fast activity. Spike and sharp wave have been reported in myoclonic seizures. The um, um, myoclonus usually um, tends to be either erratic or fragmented. In some cases, may present with continuous uh, myoclonus seizures which usually points or su uh, suggest a possibility of uh, a metabolic cause. Focal seizure usually present ictally with uh, an ictal recruiting rhythm and uh, the sequential seizures will usually depend on the particular type of a seizure uh, uh, a patient is presenting with. The epileptic spasms usually present with a high voltage, either generalized or focal, sharp or slow wave, which usually followed by a low amplitude fast activity and attenuation. So this is a classic uh, example of a bus suppression pattern, which is typical for early infantile DEEs. So the neuroimaging, it may show some structural brain malformation. So it may present with either hemimegalencephaly, 
It may present with less encephaly or poor encephaly. Some cortical dysplasia and cerebral migration disorders have also been reported in patients with uh, early infantile DEEs. Um, about 50% of all patients with early infantile DEEs will have, a, um, will have a genetic mutation. And several genes have been uh, documented, and this is um, an ever-evolving and rapid um, evolving field with new genes being discovered um, 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 frequently. And I've just displayed some of the common genes that have been reported, which have some specific or have some markers clinically which can help to identify a particular gene mutation. So the first one is a potassium channel gene mutation, which is known as KCNQ2DEE, which classically present with sequential seizures, tonic component, um, uh, mostly um, uh, with tonic seizures, but also it may present with clonic, tonic, myoclonic, as well as epileptic spasms, as well as the autonomic seizures. The sodium channel gene, the, SN, the SCN2A DEE, also present with sequential seizures, but predominantly with predominantly of tonic or the autonomic seizures. Uh, the SCN8A DEE mostly present with focal seizures, whereas the uh, syntaxin BP1 DEE mostly present with asymmetric tonic or sequential, uh, sequential seizures with autonomic, clonic, as well as epileptic spasms. Tonic seizures uh, and seizures which are typically occur like in hypermotor tonic spasm phenotype, this has been associated with uh, CDKL5 DEE and the potassium channel KCNT1 DEE normally present with tonic seizures with autonomic symptoms. Metabolic testing uh, uh, is um, normally recommended when the neuroimaging is normal, and this includes assessment of urine, plasma, and cerebrospinal fluid, uh, looking at glucose, lactate, pyruvate, and amino acid, as well as neurotransmitters in CSF, with plasma assessment of amino acid, lactic acid, uric acid, copper, ceruloplasmin, ammonia, acylcarnitine profile, transferrin, as well, uh, and very long chain fatty acids as well as organic and amino acids uh, in urine. Some of the metabolic conditions that have been associated uh, with um, uh, early infantile DEE include the non-ketotic hyperglycinemia, propionic aciduria, the molybdenum cofactor deficiency, and pyridoxine deficiency, as well as sulfide oxidized uh, deficiency. And in some of these patients, one of the clues to indicate possibly a metabolic um, uh, disorder is the frequency of the, um, of the myoclonus, which sometimes tends to be erratic or continuous uh, in a newborn. The treatment is quite challenging and most of them tend to be drug resistant, but some of the anti-seizure medications which could be, uh, which could be used with uh, some success include vigabatrin, Leveteracetam, topiramate, and valproate for conditions which have got a specific metabolic defect, which is identified through metabolic screening as well as enzyme assays. Then, specific treatment for that metabolic error can help in terms of management, uh, as well as a trial of pyridoxine as well as pyridoxal phosphate when, at, um, uh, when this, these two conditions are suspected can help in, in, in management of these children. The second uh, DEE is the epilepsy of infants with migrating focal seizures, which was previously classified as migrating partial epilepsy of infancy. It is also common uh, during the first six months of life with the mean um, age of onset at three months. Uh, boys and girls are equally affected and development is usually normal at the onset, but subsequent developmental regression ensues. The seizure semiology are commonly focal, motor clonic, or they may also present with tonic seizures. Initially, it tends to be sporadic, but it increases in frequency in weeks and months. It may present with a unilateral focal clonic or tonic, which eventually evolves into the contralateral site with uh, focal tonic or clonic activity. This may either uh, usually happens during the course of the seizure. Uh, Presentation with status epilepticus, it's, uh, it's quite common with this condition. Uh, the EEG usually presents with a normal background, but eventually they do present with generalized slowing. 
The interictal discharges show multifocal discharges commonly involving both the cerebral hemispheres. And the ictal EEG um, usually shows the migration pattern which correlates with the seizure, migrating from one side and then moving to the contralateral side. The imaging with brain MRI, it's usually normal, but subsequently it may present with diffuse atrophy. 50% of patients with epilepsy with migrating focal seizures present with the mutation in the potassium channel gene, the, KCNT, the KCNT1 mutation. Other mutations have also been reported, including the alpha, uh, the alpha 1 subunit of the voltage gated sodium channel, um, as well as the alpha 2 subunit of the voltage gated channel, as well as the SLC, uh, SLC12A5 gene, and the BRAT1 and the TBC1D424 gene. Metabolic testing um, is usually negative with this condition. However, there have been some few cases which have been reported. Uh, of um, epilepsy with migrating focal seizures, which shows, which are associated with congenital disorders of glycosylation. The third uh, DEE um, um, is the infantile spasm syndrome. Uh, this is the by far the commonest DEE that we see in our clinical practice, including in our in in our own cohort. Um, um, it includes. Two conditions. One is the West syndrome, which is a triad of epileptic spasms, developmental delay or regression, as well as the EEG finding of hips arrhythmia, and epileptic spasms. Um, these are the patients who have uh, epileptic spasms but do not fulfill the whole triad to be classified as, uh, as West syndrome. The seizure onset is usually between three and 12 months but later onset beyond infancy have been reported. In some of the patients with infantile spasm syndrome may evolve from early infantile DEE. The seizure semiology is usually, uh, it can be either flexor or the, the classic salam attacks or extensor, or in some patient it may present with mixed flexor and extensor spasms. And there's usually a, a, a association with a sleep pattern that the spasms occur either when the child is falling asleep or when the child is waking up. The incidence is around 30 per 100,000. It may occur in a child who is developing normally before the onset of the spasms, or it may, it may occur in a child who uh, has an underlying developmental delay. In about 30% of the patients, it progresses to lennox gastaut syndrome. The uh, electrophysiological studies, the EEG shows the classic uh, hips arrhythmia, which is a chaotic uh, high amplitude excessive slowing multifocal epileptic discharges with the ictal EEG showing a high amplitude generalized sharp or slow wave, which is followed by low amplitude and fast activity, which appears, um, which is, uh, appears as a brief electro decrement. Um, most patients uh, uh, present with the structural malformations and brain MRI is abnormal in up to 70% of the patients. Uh, the genetics quite varies and it's positive in 41% of the patients and the genes vary uh, uh, significantly. Um, um, it may range from trisomy 21 to uh, the tuberous sclerosis gene TSC1 and TSC2 to the deep deck five. So the genes for the infantile spasms are quite uh, diverse. The, there have been few cases which have reported metabolic abnormality in patients presenting with infantile spasm syndrome. When it comes to treatment, uh, there have been well-documented uh, efficacy to steroids and steroids vary from the ACTH and the oral, uh, 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 and the oral prednisolone. And this was based on the initially from the United Kingdom infantile spasm study, which had showed that vigabatrin uh, was effective in patients with tuberous sclerosis and steroids were effective in other conditions which are not tuberous sclerosis. But of recent, there's been a study which had compared, uh, yeah, which had compared a combination of steroid and vigabatrin compared to hormonal therapy alone. And there was a clear winner that a combination of vigabatin and predislone were more effective in cessation of uh, epileptic spasms compared to hormonal therapy uh, uh, alone. 
there are challenges in terms of the availability of bigger battery, particularly in the resource limited setting uh, due to limitations of cost. But the evidence is quite clear that the combination of uh, vigabatrin and, uh, and prednisolone is more effective compared to prednisolone alone. The next is, which is probably the most well characterized um, uh, DEE, is the Dravet syndrome, uh, which was uh, previously called the severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. It usually begins between the um, age uh, between three and nine months and affects about 6.5 uh, uh, per 100,000 children. Uh, usually the development is normal at the onset of seizures, but sub subsequently in the second year of life, these children experience a developmental regression. And some of them may present with an abnormal gait, uh, presenting as a crouch gait. The seizure semiology, initially, they do present with prolonged febrile hemiclonic seizures, uh, which can be triggered by hot water bath. Uh, this usually present during the first year, the, uh, the first year of life. Uh, subsequently, they may present with other seizure types. Classically, they, uh, they develop myoclonic seizures, atypical absence seizures, which may be prolonged, lasting for an hour or two. They may also present with generalized tonic-clonic seizures, status epilepticus, as well as the non-convulsive status. Atonic seizures have also been reported in patients with Dravet syndrome. Um, seizures tends to be exacerbated by sodium channel blockers, particularly carbamazepine uh, or oxcarbazepine and phenytoin. Uh, when it comes to investigations, uh, EEG during the first year first year of life when seizure begin, uh, it's usually normal, but subsequently they develop a generalized slowing and um, other um, a focal or multifocal or generalized epilep epileptic discharges starts. The brain MRI is usually normal at, uh, at the onset of seizures, but subsequently it has been reported uh, cerebellar and cerebral atrophy develops. And in some patients up to 30% uh, hippocampal sclerosis have been reported. This is one of the uh, syndromes which has been um, uh, well studied when it comes to molecular genetics. And up to 85% of the patients have a mutation in the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated channel. And this is the um, uh, loss of function mutation and um, uh, which, leads to, uh, which leads to the Dravet syndrome. Most of the cases, the mutation tends to be a de novo mutation, but it has been reported up to 10% uh, of the patients who have uh, the SCN1A mutation, one parent is mosaic for the mutation. The, uh, the SCN1A mutation occurs in other syndromes, and it may occur in the same family that some patients having the same mutation have Dravet syndrome. In other, uh, other family members in the same, uh, um, with the same mutation have milder forms of epilepsy, uh, milder form of seizure, uh, including the simple febrile seizures and other may present with genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus. So there's a quite diverse uh, heterogeneity with the, uh, with, uh, with the alpha-1 subunit voltage-gated sodium channel. Um, when the symptoms begin in less than three months with movement disorder after the onset, and then this points towards the SCN1A, uh, L infantile DEE. When it comes to um, management, there have been several studies which have looked into the um, uh, management of Dravet syndrome. And what has been shown uh, is that a, a combination of steripental and clobazam, as well as so sodium valproate, tends to be um, more efficacious in terms of reduction in the um, reduction in the seizure frequency. The next one is the um, etiology specific DEEs, and um, one is the KCNQ2 DEE, which tends to have a neonatal onset, and the seizure types tends to be focal tonic. But other seizure types, focal clonic and myoclonic have been reported and some presented with autonomic features, including apnea. The developmental outcome tends to be uh, varies. Uh, it may present with either moderate to severely impaired. 
EEG also present with the suppression bust pattern in more than 60% of, of them, it tends to be asymmetric, but EEG may also show multifocal spikes as well as sharp waves. Some signal abnormalities on neuroimaging have been reported, particularly in the basal ganglia and thalamus. And um, the, the mutation mostly is the KCNQ2 de novo missense uh, mutation. And some of these um, mutation tends to be a gain of function mutation, and they may respond to sodium channel blocking medications such as uh, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Um, another rare but unimportant conditions to, to identify because this can be um, uh, easily treated is the pyridoxine dependent and pyridoxamine 5 phosphate deficiency DEE. These both the two conditions, the pyridoxine and the pyridoxamine 5 phosphate, they occur in the lysine degradation pathway. They tend to be uh, uh, related to um, uh, genetic as well as the uh, metabolic uh, dysfunction. Onset tends to be shortly after birth, and they do present with um, encephalopathy as well as seizures. There has also been reported cases of intrauterine seizures, which usually present with excessive fetal movements. And um, the pyridoxine dependent epilepsy and pyridoxine dependent and pyridoxamine 5 phosphate deficiency DEE have also been reported to occur uh, beyond the newborn period. And up to 25% of the children present after the third year of life. Uh, premature birth, uh, they may also. Uh, Classic presentation usually may present with a premature birth, neonatal distress, irritability, vomiting, acidosis, as well as a low APGA score, which could mimic uh, the presentation of the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The subsequent developmental uh, outcome is uh, impaired, which varies from mild developmental impairment to severe. And the seizure types usually uh, present with multifocal myoclonus, which may be continuous, which may either involve the limbs, the trunk, the eyes, or the face. Other seizure types which have been reported include focal uh, seizures, as well as epileptic spasms, and generalized tonic, as well as clonic seizures. Um, the classic presentation, which should alert the clinicians of a possibility of a pyridoxine uh, dependent epilepsy or pyridoxine dependent uh, or pyridoxamine 5 phosphate deficiency. DEE is the hyper, a, a hyperkinetic newborn who seems to be distressed, who is agitated, and who is presenting with continuous multifocal myoclonus or presenting with spasms. Um, the classic EEG uh, finding in this condition is the bus suppression pattern, but multifocal spikes as well as generalized slowing has been reported, particularly before the initiation of treatment. Uh, when you initiate treatment, uh, uh, the abnormality tends to subside. The brain MRI may also show a white matter edema. The genetics is, tends to be positive for the uh, pyridoxine dependent epilepsy, particularly involving the gene ALDH7A or antiquitin gene and the PLB gene. For the pyridoxamine 5 phosphate deficiency, it tends to be positive for the PNPO gene. The metabolic testing uh, usually reveals raised biomarkers, which includes the alpha aminoadipic semialdehyde, as well as pipecolic acid in urine, as well as plasma, uh, elevated in plasma, as well as in cerebrospinal fluid. Management is the um, um, using either pyridoxine or pyridoxyl 5 phosphate. And this should be initiated early, even before confirmation of either genetic or metabolic testing. And um, when facilities are not available for doing genetic or metabolic testing, or which may take longer to receive the results. So patients who are suspicious of having this condition should be given a trial of pyridoxine. Um, and if they don't respond, then also pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Now, the other um, childhood onset DEEs, uh, the first one is the myoclonic uh, atonic epilepsy, which was previously uh, known as epilepsy with myoclonic atonic epilepsy, also known as the DO syndrome. Uh, the onset is usually between two to six years. 
In these conditions, uh, the boys are affected more than girls with an incidence of one in every uh, 10,000 um, uh, children. It accounts for about 2% of all childhood onset epilepsy. With the myoclonic atonic epilepsy, uh, development is usually normal in two thirds prior to the onset of seizures. And uh, the classic seizure types which presents with this DEE is the myoclonic atonic uh, uh, seizures which are mandatory for the, diagnosis, for the diagnosis of this condition. Other seizure types may present include myoclonic, atonic, as well as the generalized tonic-clonic seizures. And these patients may also present with the non-convulsive status epilepticus. When they do present with tonic seizures, this usually is a, it's, it's a marker of a, of a poor outcome. When it comes to investigations, um, so the background at the onset of seizure is usually normal, but it may present with a biparietal theta rhythm, um, which is usually a, a, good a, a good marker for the possibility of the myoclonic atonic epilepsy, as well as generalized high amplitude uh, slowing. The interictal discharges um, or the interictal abnormality usually is a generalized three to six has spike and slow wave or it may also present with a polyspike and slow wave, which may occur in bursts lasting for about two to six sec uh, seconds. Long sequences of irregular two to three hertz spike and slow wave discharges usually indicate the presence of a, a non-convulsive status epilepticus. Uh, it may also present with generalized spike wave, particularly activated in sleep, and the hyperventilation may elicit a spike wave discharges uh, as well as um, um, eliciting the absent seizures. The ICTO recording of myoclonic atonic seizures usually uh, shows a generalized polyspike or spike wave discharges during the myoclonic component, which is usually followed by a high voltage slow wave, which accompanies the atonic uh, component. The brain MRI is usually normal, and in one third of the patients with myoclonic atonic epilepsy, they do have a family history of either epilepsy or febrile seizures. And um, some pathogenic variants which have been uh, reported with the myoclonic atonic epilepsy includes the SCN1A128 and the um, syntaxin um, STX1B131 gene, as well as the SLC6A1 gene. Treatment uh, is usually with anti-seizure medications, um, including um, a combination of valproic acid, levetiracetam, lamotrigine, and topiramate, as well as zonisamide. In some patients where they are drug resistant, then ketogenic diet is also an option for the control of the seizures. The other most uh, common childhood onset uh, DEE is the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, which is a triad of three, uh, uh, um, three features. One is the intractable multiple seizure types, um, which usually accompanies cognitive and behavioral impairment. And the third one is the electrophysiological study, which is a diffuse slow spike wave or generalized paroxysmal fax activity on an EEG. The onset um, is usually between 18 months and eight years with a peak at three to five years. This accounts for about one to 2% of all epilepsies. Again, boys affected more than girls, just like in the myoclonic uh, as, um, atonic epilepsy. It may evolve from other earlier onset DEEs, which include infantile syndrome, Infantile spasm syndrome, in which 30% of these evolve into LGS, as well as the early infantile DEE. Patients with LGS may have an underlying developmental delay before the onset of uh, the onset of the seizures, and um, or some may have a normal development, but again the development uh, they have developmental stag uh, stagnation or they have a developmental regression after the onset of the seizures. The classic seizure types is the nocturnal tonic seizures, which usually may last for three seconds up to two minutes. It tends to be exacerbated by sleep as well as medication which induce sleep, such as the high dose benzodiazepine. 
Other seizure types which, uh, which, may, um, which may occur in patients with LGS include the absence seizures. They also present with very frequent atonic seizures, which may result into facial injuries. Myoclonic seizures, they may also present with focal impaired awareness, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, as well as the non-convulsive uh, status epilepticus, which was formerly called the obtundation status which may last for a very prolonged period of time. It may last for days, and in some cases, it has been reported to last for up to weeks, where patients um, may look very unresponsive and staring, and, and this is usually suspicious. Possibly, they might be in a non-convulsive status epilepticus. The electrophysiological studies shows um, a, a diffuse theta slowing, which is mostly pronounced frontally, if they do present with a biparietal slowing, slowing, theta waves should mostly suggest possibility of the myoclonic aesthetic epilepsy. The interictal EEG shows the classic slow, usually 1.5 to 2.5 hertz spike wave discharges, uh, which has an anterior predominant, as well as a generalized paroxysmal fast activity up to 10 hertz, which usually becomes more prominent in sleep. Uh, lasting for a few seconds. Other uh, interictal dis uh, discharges, multifocal as well as focal slow spike wave discharges have also been reported. The icto discharges, the, the classic uh, seizure type which occurs in LGS tonic seizures usually presents with bilateral, uh, burst of bilateral 10 hertz or higher frequency fast activity which uh, with a recruiting rhythm. The MRI is usually um, uh, abnormal. It may be diffuse or it may present with focal cortical malformations. It may present with features of tuberous sclerosis, as well as in some patients with acquired features of acquired brain injury, such as the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. In some of the patients, the MRI may also be normal. Um, some de novo mutations have been reported in patients with LGS. Um, and it should be suspected in patients who have got a structural brain disorder, which is suggestive of a genetic disorder, such as specific types of the lysencephalies. Metabolic testing is rarely positive, and there have been very rare cases of neurometabolic disorder which have been associated with LGS. It should only be considered when the MRI is normal and the genetic studies do not reveal any pathogenic ge uh, genetic mutations. Most of the seizures tends to be drug resistant, but some of the anti-seizure medications which can be used to, um, to manage patients with LGS include valproic acid, lamotrigine, topiramate, zonisamide, and rufinamide, mostly uh, in, in, in combination. Um, vagus nerve stimulation have also have shown to have about 50% seizure reduction in patients with LGS. Surgical um, inter... Uh, Epilepsy surgery is also a consideration in patients with um, LGS, particularly the corpus callosotomy, which has been shown to reduce the frequency of the drop attacks. Ketogenic diet is also useful in patients with LGS, and it's mostly efficacious for, uh, for the atonic, myoclonic, as well as the typical absence seizures. Immunotherapy, uh, corticosteroids, and intravenous immunoglobulin have been used in some patients with LGS with some equivocal uh, results, particularly when the seizures become mostly more frequent. There have been recent uh, studies looking at the use of the cannabis extract, the cannabidiol, and it has been shown there are some positive results showing a significant reduction in seizure frequency but the data has not been, um, there has been no enough data to, uh, to suggest routine uh, recommendation for the use, particularly concerning the safety of the cannabidiol. Um, the other one is the developmental end or epileptic encephalopathy with spike wave activation in sleep, which was formerly called the epileptic encephalopathy with continuous spike wave in slow wave sleep. This is a condition. Uh, this is a um, condition which encompasses a spectrum of condition with similar features. Mostly, the spike wave activation which occurs in in sleep, 
and uh, management implications for all these conditions. So it includes the landau klafner syndrome. It also includes the uh, epileptic encephalopathy with continuous spike wave in sleep, as well as the atypical benign partial epilepsy, which is also called the pseudo uh, Lennox syndrome. The onset is usually between two to 12 years with a peak of four to five years. This condition may present with or without seizures. When it presents with seizures, it may present with uh, focal motor with or without impaired awareness. It may also present with focal to bilateral tonic clonic as well as typical and atypical absence seizures. A tonic focal motor seizures with negative myoclonus have also been uh, reported, but some patients may just present with speech regression or may present with, um, um, with language regression um, where the um, they, they, they fail to understand common items that they used to understand previously. The EEG uh, mostly shows um, focal or diffuse slowly, slowing, but during drowsiness and sleep, that's when marked activation of, of epileptum, epileptum activity occurs, which is almost continuous, slow of 1.5 to 2 hertz spike wave activation. Previously, it was deemed that you need to have a continuous spike wave activity of more than 85% for the definition of, uh, of this condition. But studies have shown even patients who have got lesser uh, part of the, spli of, of, this, of, the, of the slow sleep, which is comprised of the spike wave activity, also have cognitive regression. So, uh, so the uh, re uh, recent recommendation is um, to have at least more than 50% of the slow sleep, which is comprised of the slow spike wave activity. Uh, normal sleep architecture, that is the vertex sharp waves and the sleep spindles and K complex are usually uh, absent. The MRI is usually normal, or it may show underlying brain malformations, such as the perisylvian polymicrogyria, which has been reported in patients with these conditions. Our genetics, um, some have some genetic basis uh, related to the green to, uh, green to A gene, and about 50% of the patients will have a family history of seizures. Treatment uh, required the use of uh, corticosteroid, um, either methylprednisolone or and uh, uh, other anti-seizure medications, particularly the benzodiazepine and the valproic acid. So in conclusion, uh, the developmental and epileptic ence uh, encephalopathy is an evolving um, concept with evolving pathophysiology. Uh, the classification and organization of this condition is quite dynamic and possibly it will keep on changing as further understanding um, regarding the molecular genetics and metabolic testing uh, in, um, improves with uh, advancement in, in technology. It's important uh, for determining precision medicine, research, as well as uh, prognosis. Um, so early clinical assessment and epilepsy classification is important so that uh, that early assessment and classification could guide a early etiology directed investigation to determine whether is it uh, um, linked to a genetic etiology or is it related to the structural etiology and possibly that in future could be uh, could lead into a precision therapy, which not only uh, would be able to control the seizures, but also could be um, will be useful in terms of controlling the other comorbidities which usually accompany uh, the DEEs. So thank you very much for for listening. Now we'll welcome any questions or comments from the from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Keija, for a, a very informative and uh, comprehensive uh, talk on uh, develop the developmental epileptic encephalopathy, uh, where all of, of, all of us uh, share uh, a quite a good number of uh, uh, patients in our practice. And again, uh, we face a lot of challenges uh, trying to uh, manage those patients and provide good care to them. Uh, um, I will go through the questions and uh, from the audience, and they were quite good questions. Uh, so uh, the first question was on 
the infantile spasm uh, combination therapy uh, about the doses uh, that were used in the uh, as a combination uh, in the combination uh, therapy trial the doses of ACTH uh, and vigabatrin I guess yes so the vigabatrin was used at a dose of 100 milligram per kilo per day and the so they they had two arms one arm they used the uh, prednisolone and the other arm they used the uh, tetracoside uh, steroid the prednisolone arm they used the four milligram per kilo uh, per day and most of their patients were on 10 milligrams six hourly okay uh, the next question is uh, during the evolution of epileptic encephalopathy is this mission uh, were there any specific EEG abnormalities? So in that in combination with seizures and cognitive decline were found to meet uh, the criteria for the definition. Okay, so the, the most important uh, is not the specific uh, EEG abnormality, but the frequency of the interictal EEG abnormality and the seizures in relation to the cognitive decline. That was the one that was used for the... Um, for the definition of the epileptic encephalopathy. Another question on uh, myclonic uh, atonic epilepsy and can nodding syndrome be classified as uh, MAE? So nodding syndrome is an interesting one, um, which has been reported in Uganda, in South Sudan, and some other part of the, uh, as well as in Tanzania. And initially, the, the, the head nodes were thought to be a tonic drops. And there has been a, an extensive study on the nodding syndrome, um, thinking possibly it could be a form of the myoclonic atonic uh, epilepsy. But later it was found it is not. And nodding syndrome was classified as, as an independent syndrome separate from the myoclonic uh, atonic epilepsy. So it is is not part of the uh, of the myoclonic atonic epilepsy. Yeah. Uh, another question is uh, about uh, the work uh, diagnostic workup of those disorders in a limit in a resource limited uh, countries. Uh, a question about uh, what is uh, the basis to request uh, request genetic workup and for which type. So this is quite a challenge for us for detailed assessment of patients with DEE, because some of them will need very sophisticated uh, investigations, and some of these sophisticated investigations are, are expensive um, and available only in big cities, and some of them are not even uh, available in, in, in these cities. So the most important or the clear, uh, uh, key aspect in a resource limited set setting is the clear uh, assessment or clear classification of the epilepsy, which is based on the based on the seizure types, and also assisted by the EEG. Where in some of the resource limited setting, the EEG is available. So once you have those two the clear um, uh, description of the epilepsy and uh, with assistance of you classify some of these epilepsy symptoms. When it comes to genetics, where you really need to do genetics or to do metabolic screening, then you may need to consult Uh, Dr. Kija. I think uh, Dr. Kija might be exper uh, experiencing some network issues. Uh, uh, we'll wait for him to come back. Thank you. Sorry, I lost connection a bit. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> so we were Thank on you. the talk about genetic uh, workup. So uh, what uh, do you advise any uh, sort of a basic metabolic uh, 
uh, work up or um, uh, to start with, uh, in, uh, particularly in uh, resource limited countries. Yes, yeah, so with the basic metabolic work in, in resource limited setting, you can start. Um, so if you have facility available for urine and plasma, amino and organic acid, that would be useful. But if you cannot, then possibly lactate and ammonia. Um, there's also um, some, um, but at least to do the use that can help to start with before you go to a very comprehensive assessment. Uh, there's a question on corpus callosotomy and clinical par, uh, practice. When, uh, when do we decide to go for corpus uh, callosotomy? Okay, so for the corpus callosotomy, it seems it's very, and when you have already tried the anti seizure medication and it has not worked, and you've tried the ketogenic diet and it has not worked, and the patient is presenting with frequent atonic seizures, then you can consider the corpus callosotomy. Uh, for developmental epileptic encephalopathy, uh, when we decide to start steroids, how long can it be given? Uh, uh, how long do we uh, continue with it, given because that if steroids are they don't have, And if often because of either surgery. Hello? Yes, hello. Um, uh, there's another question on uh, steroids. How long do we give them, given that steroids is usually uh, have uh, side effects? The duration of treatment with steroids, I guess the question. So steroids, with, with the, they are usually given as a bust. So you usually give it for like a week, you give the methylprednisolone bust for about a week, and then after that you stop. So you don't give it for a prolonged period of time. So in that, in that, yeah. in that pulsing, in that pulse of the steroid, you may get, um, you may get fever because um, they may get uh, uh, immediately after that. So you don't use long-term treatment with steroids. Um, there's another question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a compliment, uh, amazing and detailed presentation. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kija. Uh, there's a, another question on sodium channel blockers. Uh, uh, do they have a place in the treatment of encephalopathies? Can you repeat that question, sorry? Uh, the question is about uh, sodium channel blockers. Do they have uh, a, a role in the treatment of developmental uh, encephalopathies? So it depends on the type. So for those patients, like the, uh, the SCN1A mutation, the Dravet syndrome, where they have a mutation, which is a loss of function mutation, the sodium channel blockers tends to make the seizures worse. But for the other, which is, I've got a mutation and it's a gain of function mutation, like the KSNQ2 mutation. Then the sodium channel blockers can, but it really depends on the, on the type of the DEE. A uh, question about uh, autism spectrum disorders and ADHD uh, are com uh, combined disorders in developmental epileptic encephalopathies. What about their treatment? So I guess uh, the treatment of ASD and ADHD uh, that we so see. So this is very interesting and, uh, what is postulated yeah. to be Yes, yeah, so this is a very interesting question, and this uh, forms the basis of what is postulated to be the benefits of having precision medicine. Um, that if we could identify a specific gene therapy for a particular DEE, it will not only address
the it not only address the company the epilepsy, but currently, um, um, with the exception of the tuberous sclerosis complex, the other conditions you follow the same standard treat the standard management of the uh, of the autism and 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 ADHD um, with the use of the speech therapy, occupational therapy, and applied behavioral analysis therapy. The same with ADHD, and in some of it could also have a role. Uh, I think there is uh, an interest uh, that's ignited today on uh, nodding syndrome, so there is a request to have more details on nodding syndrome. Okay, so um, so nodding syndrome is quite ex is, is quite an extensive. But just to speak briefly, it was first where children were found to have some uh, first of all stunted, and um, they have uh, they had failed to thrive. Uh, most of them had malnutrition, and they were seen to have these nods when they see food. So when they see food, and then they start to have these nods, which could occur in clusters. could even fall because of this. Because looking at what could be the possible etiosis, whether it's uh, related to the nodding syndrome. There have also, also been studies looking at possibility of the autoimmune possibility, autoimmune uh, possibility for the uh, nodding syndrome. But again, most of these studies have not revealed very conclusive uh, results. This is the um, uh, um, possibility, a link between the I think Dr. Kija is still experiencing difficulties with his um, network. Can you hear me? Uh, it, it's on and off. It keeps uh, cut off occasionally. Hello. Uh, yes, Dr. Kija. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, now we hear, uh, we hear you, but uh, you were cut off in between, um, I think, at the end of uh, the part on Nordic syndrome. Okay. Um, so I was saying there, there have been an extensive study. The ability of the etiology of Nordic syndrome as well as looking at the possibilities of nodding syndrome and autoimmune abnormalities. And most of these results, um, um, most of these studies have not revealed very positive conclusive results, apart from a remote link between nodding syndrome and onchocerciasis. Uh, there's another question on uh, sex uh, predilection in, uh, is there any scientific explanation in LGS and uh, myclonic atonic epilepsy? Hello? Uh, yes, Dr. Kija. Is there any uh, scientific explanation why uh, there is sex predilection in uh, myclonic atonic epilepsy and LGS? So, why is it so more common in boys? So far, now, and that has been a finding which has, yeah. in both the two conditions, start very early on, where the hormonal effect has uh, is does not play a big role. So, uh, so far, there hasn't been any explanation to explain why boys are affected more than than girls in the two DEEs. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice uh, presentation. Uh, there is a question on uh, how do we differentiate between epileptic encephalopathy and epilepsy secondary to a motor cerebral disability. I guess this was answered in the talk. Uh, what's the main characteristic of epileptic encephalopathy? So the question is, what are the main characteristics of DEE? Yeah, yeah yes. so he, uh, like, uh, I guess, to how to differentiate from static uh, encephalopathy associated with cerebral palsy.
Hello? Yes, uh, Edward. Um... Yeah, so the, so the developmental encephalopathy is, is where, where a child presents with um, a developmental delay. Um, develop hello uh, uh, yes so the is is the question is the difference between developmental encephalopathy and DEE or did I get the question wrong uh, yes uh, the question between uh, I think static encephalopathy like in uh, that we see in uh, cerebral palsy like and uh, and uh, DEE Okay, and? And the uh, motor cerebral disability, like epileptic encephalopathy and epileptic secondary to motor cerebral dis disability uh, uh, compared to epileptic encephalopathy. Yes, so one of the causes for developmental encephalopathy is a condition such is an acquired brain insult possibility of, of having a developmental insult. It can occur because of a structural problem like a congenital brain malformation, but also because of an acquired uh, um, structural malformations like, uh, like a HIE. Uh, there is also a question on, uh, again, resource limited countries. Uh, what's the advice uh, for genetic testing? Because many uh, poor people cannot afford uh, to do the genetic testing. So is there a basic uh, genetic test maybe they can start off with that can be afford, uh, afforded by patients? So the genetic testing are becoming cheaper. Uh, if you compare the cost, how it used to be, and right now they are becoming cheaper. And, um, and hopefully cheaper. The cost of doing targeted gene testing is even cheaper, but that again requires a, a, a quite an extensive description and only focusing on one particular gene as compared to do uh, like a whole exome sequencing, uh, which could give you a, a better yield. The costs are becoming cheaper. So hopefully in the next coming years, Would you advise to go for epilepsy panel first or go straight to a whole exome sequencing? Sorry, I didn't get that, Dr. Uh, would you advise to go for uh, epilepsy panel or uh, to go uh, straight to a whole exome sequencing? So epilepsy panel would be used But again, I think all exome sequencing will be panel, which might miss some of the student in the epilepsy panel. Uh, again, thank you very much for uh, an excellent lecture. Um, uh, there is a question on uh, what medications to avoid in uh, developmental epileptic encephalopathy. Use of so the seizure medication. Yes, so again, this will depend on the DEE is not a specific one. Depending on the specific one, then you may avoid some of the medications which have been shown to exacerbate the seizures in that particular condition. For example, if you're suspecting a patient might be having a Dravet syndrome, then you may need to avoid sodium channel blockers, which may exacerbate uh, the seizures. If you're having a patient who you suspect might have an LGS, then you may need to avoid high dose benzodiazepine which may also make uh, the seizures worse. Uh, there's a question on, uh, can we use uh, phenobarbital as a treatment for epilepsy too? Uh, uh, yes, phenobarbital is quite useful, but works very well in controlling many seizure types. So yes, it can be used. And uh, what's the difference between gram mal, petite mal seizures? Okay, so very good question. So like I said at the, be uh, at the beginning of my, my talk, 
the classification of epilepsy has been evolving since the 1900, with some terms being used and some terms being removed and some terms being introduced. So one of the terms which have been removed from the recent classifications are those two, the grand mal and the petite. Classification they used to mean and petite mal used to also. So these terms are no longer used to, to mean or to imply. I uh, thank you very much. I think uh, those questions uh, conclude uh, today's uh, meeting. Um, uh, um, I would like uh, to remind uh, the attendees uh, to uh, fill in uh, the form uh, for uh, the session today uh, in order to receive their uh, certification. And uh, I would like on behalf uh, of uh, everyone and our um, quite good audience uh, today uh, to uh, thank Dr. Edward uh, Kije for a very, uh, for an excellent uh, informative uh, presentation and a comprehensive review on developmental and epileptic encephalopathies uh, spanning from neonatal period uh, to childhood. Uh, you can scan, uh, bring your phones and scan uh, the QR uh, code in order to access uh, the survey and this will enable